Well, it's a little different being back in church now than it used to be. And on such a happy, long-awaited Sunday, it may seem a little strange to turn to the unfamiliar book of Habakkuk. It's one of the shortest books in the Old Testament. In amongst all those 30 and 40 chapter epics, this book is only three chapters long. It is not the most cheerful of books, dealing as it does with faith in the midst of hard times. Yet, in Habakkuk's three chapters, there's an amazing transformation from deep grief and lament to peace and inner calm, from the depths of despair to the heights of joy, from how long must I call for help, Lord, to my Lord gives me strength. And yet, nothing really happens in this book, as we'll see. Habakkuk isn't delivering a message from God to God's people as prophets do. There's no great journey from wilderness to safety, no sudden move from exile to freedom. The circumstances of Habakkuk's life don't change at all, but he does. This book is about Habakkuk's personal struggle with faith in hard times, his own relationship with God, and a turning point in that relationship. In the first chapter of the book, in the first four verses, Habakkuk's words of grief and frustration explain both the problem and his gut reaction to it. How long, Lord, must I cry for help? But you do not listen. I call out to you violence, but you do not deliver. Why do you force me to witness injustice? Why do you put up with wrongdoing? Destruction and violence confront me. Conflict is present, and one must endure strife. For this reason, the law lacks power, and justice is never carried out. Indeed, the wicked intimidate the innocent. For this reason, justice is perverted. The problem is easy enough to work out. No justice anywhere. Habakkuk lived and worked as God's prophet during the final decades of Judah, the last surviving kingdom of God's people. The kingdom of Israel had already been conquered and most of the people taken away into exile. And Judah was now under constant pressure from other nations, lobbed back and forth like a tennis ball between greater and more powerful kingdoms as the borders changed and battles were won and lost. That international tug of war produced internal chaos. And as Judah's time as an independent nation drew to a close, they lost their way descending into moral and spiritual decay. Everywhere Habakkuk looked, all he could see were people taking advantage of each other, lying and stealing and cheating, people hurting each other with swords and words and money and whatever they could get their hands on. What a hard thing for a faithful follower of God to see happening right in his own country. When there's so much that is wrong, where do you start to make it right? Well, Habakkuk starts with God. He questions the way things are, the way God runs things, and asks God to give an accounting of the world as it is under his sovereign rule. It's amazing how the more things change, the more some things are exactly the same. Habakkuk's words of grief and lament over the violence and injustice and downright wrongness of the world, we could easily say the same about our world these past few months, too. Whether it's the sickness and, and death caused by the virus itself, or its effect felt in practically every aspect of our lives, or even just the usual sorrows and injustices of harmful politics and poverty, Habakkuk wanted to know where God was in the story. And after the year we've had so far, and the year we're still having, maybe we'd kind of like to know the same thing. Because I find that it's, it's one thing to struggle through hard times, to live through something difficult and painful, while believing that there's no one out there greater than humanity that can help. That's one thing, but it's something else again to believe in a God who is good and powerful and to still live in a world of suffering and fear. How do we reconcile our faith in God with the facts of the world as it is? It's hard. To believe that God is good, that God has the power and the will to create, to save, to heal, to do anything. And yet, 
destruction and violence confront us too. We might very easily be tempted to say to God, we quit. You're just going to have to go on without us. It's too much. But that is precisely what Habakkuk does not do. He asks his how longs and his whys, but he doesn't give up. And I actually think it's his faith that made him ask, that makes us ask, that makes us look at the world and be sad and confused and frustrated by it. It's precisely because we do believe in God and that God is good, that injustice and suffering in the world confuse us so much. Now, we won't read the whole book because three chapters is a bit too long, but trust me when I tell you that God responds to Habakkuk's confused and frustrated questions with an answer that is complex and subtle and nearly as hard to take as the awful situation Habakkuk is already in. He doesn't hesitate to call God out on the dangers of this plan that involves Judah being invaded and exiled too. And yet, Habakkuk resolves to listen and to wait. After hearing God's plan at the beginning of chapter two, Habakkuk wrote this, I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and it doesn't lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. So God says, wait and don't give up. Keep faith. Live by that faith for just a little longer. The vision God promises to Habakkuk is of the coming of justice and of making all things whole and right again in the world. And at the beginning of chapter 3 in verse 1, Habakkuk says, full of hope and conviction. O Lord, I have heard what you have done, and I am filled with awe. Now do again in our times the great deeds you used to do. Over the course of of this book, a wonderful picture of faith emerges as Habakkuk has this moment of crisis in his relationship with God and then comes out the other side of it, transformed. The righteous, those who trust God, who follow God, who love God, the righteous live now in the light of promises received. God has promised a vision of a world where there is justice, fairness, generosity, compassion, and companionship. We live now and worship now and even act now in full faith that it will come. Yes, when we look around, we see a world in which all too often our faith in a good God raises nearly as many questions as it answers. But we trust that God's vision is coming and growing even now. This is, this is the usual kind of faith we talk about here. It's a hopeful kind of faith, a kind of faith that lights a fire in us and sends us out the door, believing and certain and fired up, ready to go, waiting for what we're hoping for, certain that it's coming, even when it's hard to see. But faith doesn't end there. At the very end of chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, Habakkuk goes a little further with his faith, moving from that fired up, hopeful energy into something a little more settled, something deep and peaceful and lasting. Though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vines, though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, Though the flock is cut off from the fold, and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and makes me tread upon the heights. That picture of hopeful, fired-up faith, drawn for us by Habakkuk, has this other side, it seems showing us another way that we live by faith. Faith hopes, but faith also loves. This second side of Habakkuk's picture of faith shows us a faith for long sleepless nights full of worry. 
It shows us faith at the end of a bad day or a hard week. Faith that keeps us going through months of quarantine or a grief-laden year. This is a picture of faith when our whys and our how longs overwhelm us as crisis after crisis hits. And that faith looks like this. We do not rejoice only when the barns are full, when the fields are teeming with livestock, and when the orchards blossom. We rejoice in God, in God's blessings, even when the barns and the pastures and the branches are empty. Habakkuk discovered that he loved God, not just the blessings God gave him and his people. And this picture of total failure, of an uncertain future, of a hopeless moment, helps us discover that a faithful heart can yet rejoice in a God who is good, even when there's not much good to be seen. And by the end of Habakkuk's book, his homeland's position politically has not changed. Judah is still a small, floundering nation, populated and led mostly by morally and spiritually bankrupt people. The empire that will invade and take the last of God's free people into exile skirts around the horizon, just out of sight. The situation is not improved. And yet, Habakkuk is uplifted, encouraged, because his faith has been transformed. Whatever happens, however bad it will get, and it does get pretty bad, as often as he questions and laments, as empty as his barns and his storehouses get, his faith will remain, rooted in love for God. Now, there is a wealth of trust expressed in making that last step, from having faith in what God is doing and has done and will do, to having faith in God just because he's God and we love him. And yet, that's the unconditional, generous way that God loves us, isn't it? Not because of what we can do, but just because we are. It's a hard step to take, but it's worth it. And in that last verse of Habakkuk, that joyous upswell of peace and buoyant freedom of that last step of faith can take us dancing along the heights, sure-footed as a deer, strong and safe in our relationship with God forever, too. Thanks be to God. Amen.